Lecture 2, The Role of the Living Prophet by Hiram L. Andrus. Our second theme of discussion on the Doctrine and Covenants deals with the role of the living prophet. I want to emphasize that word living in more than one way. As it pertains to the prophet, we are talking about the one who is alive and who holds the keys of the kingdom at a particular period. And as of now, that is President Ezra Taft Benson. But I'd like to have you see the word living or life in a broader sense than just that we have a living person who is speaking. In 2 Timothy 1.10, the Apostle Paul is speaking of Christ, and he says, But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now, ponder on that for a while, because it's very important. The gospel is not merely a theological system. It's not merely put together, putting together the jigsaw puzzle, all the statements that we know pertaining to where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. The gospel is not merely a social order or, and a social program and a way of life. The gospel is in the most literal sense of meaning a plan of life, in that through the gospel there is the infusion into the individual of powers, literal powers of life, living powers that quicken, that animate, that enliven, that enlighten a person's life and actually transforms that person. Paul uses the word translated, translated us into the kingdom of Christ, literally transform that person to a higher order of life and of being. In 3 Nephi 14.14, 14, the Savior makes this statement to the Nephites, straight is the gate, and it is spelled S-T-R-A-I-T, which means narrow like the Strait of Magellan. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Then you have Nephi saying in 2 Nephi 33, just as he is signing off his writings in the Book of Mormon and talking about his feelings for both Jews and Gentiles, he adds this comment, Behold, for none of these can I hope except they shall be reconciled unto Christ and enter into the narrow gate and walk in the straight path which leads to life and continue in the path until the end of the day of probation. The gospel then is a plan of life. Let me just take the Savior's comments and run through a few of them with you. Let's begin with John 6 where the Savior is speaking. You really kind of have to think and ponder this through and not let it go in order to finally understand it. It's worth the effort. You see the gospel in a much more meaningful way. Verse 63 of John 6, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. That doesn't mean very much to us today. The gods of America are those who have physical agility, and I'm not being cantankerous or sour greepism. I'm not saying that it is inappropriate to develop physical prowess and that kind of thing. I'm just saying you don't worship it. You don't worship it as we are doing today. It's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They are actually the transmission of life. When a person speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost, there is actually a power of life this way and that way, right through. I've seen that in actual experience to the point where I could see it, just literally, boom, out like that. And you feel, not only feel, but see the flow of the spirit. And it's a marvelous kind of thing. But the point I want to make is this, that the gospel is a program to infuse life and truth and power into fallen, unregenerate people who have weaknesses and elevate them as they apply the principles or moral and spiritual discipline in their lives also, and elevate them finally back to where they have eternal life, which is to have the fullness of celestial glory or power. Over in chapter 10, for example, of the book of John, Jesus speaking, verse 10, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. Not just the abundant life in the sense that you get your life established on good principles. That's an abundant life, but coupled with that, the infusion of spiritual truth and power from God. Be a sunflower. A sunflower knows enough to get its face toward the sun, because there is something coming. We need to get our face toward the sun, because there is something coming from him to us. He is the light and the life of the world. When our lives are centered in this way, then we begin to get that flow. In chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. There are two things, resurrection, putting your spirit back into your body. I am also the life. 
The ultimate fulfillment of that is the endowment of the individual with celestial glory so that he is being like the Father and the Son who are in the sacred gulf with a brilliance of light and life and power within that person that would eclipse the light of the sun at noonday. Think of yourselves as being like the Father and the Son were. That's the great destiny of the gospel, to infuse new life, not just remit sins, not just to resurrect, but to infuse life and sanctify and transform and change and finally endow with a celestial glory. That's the purpose of the gospel. Dare to be like the Father and the Son were in the first vision, because that's your destiny. Over here again in John fourteen six, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. We've said then that the gospel is a plan of life, and that doesn't merely mean that it is a plan by which you can establish and regulate your life. Again, it's the plan by which you can have infused into your life new truths, new powers, new quickening influences that are even more dynamic than the light of the sun is to the sunflower, and eventually be glorified in that. That's an important point when we talk about the role of the prophet. That's an important point to keep that one in mind. Now, the word is spirit. <clears throat> when we talk about the word of the Lord in the sense that I would use that term here, the word of the Lord is not contained in that book. That's the standard works of the truth of the church. That is not the word of the Lord. That is merely a publication containing a bunch of symbols, which we call letters and put together in words of the English language. The word of the Lord is spirit. The word of the Lord is a living dynamic power. Here in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 43, And now I give unto you a commandment to beware concerning yourselves, to give diligent heed to the words of eternal life. For you shall live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. Note now that he explains it. For the word of the Lord is truth, and whatsoever is truth is light, and whatsoever is light is spirit, even the spirit of Jesus Christ. So the word of the Lord is truth, it's light, it's spirit, and it's the spirit of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord is a substance, it's a pure, fine substance, which we call the glory of Christ, his spirit, his power, and it's filled with the attributes and intellectual qualities of his mind. It has the capability to transfer those from him to us and to transfer the life of him as a glorified being to us and build that within us. And the great goal then is to be sanctified and glorified in that. When we are born again, then we are born by living power into a newness of life. Over here in 1 Peter, for instance, you have the chief apostle making the statement in chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. When we are baptized, then we actually enter into a covenant relationship into a newness of life. Note how the Apostle Paul puts this in Romans 6, 3. Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? We put away our old life, our old man, and we did it in an act symbolizing death. And we put ourselves into a grave, a watery grave symbolic of the tomb. We did this voluntarily. He says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. That newness of life comes through Jesus Christ. Verse 11 of Romans 8. And if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also Christ. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The church, then, is a living body. Paul calls it the body of Christ. It's not a robotic. It's not a robot. It's not designed that a person should be moved around like a billiard player moves a ball. It's designed instead that through faith and through our eye being single to God, we acquire new life. Part of that new life experience is revelatory life, life of revelation with the gifts of the Spirit, and that we as individuals, each of us, is alive spiritually. And as members of the church, we each have gifts of the Spirit, a gift or multiple gifts of the Spirit, and those gifts are not talents. Sad is the time when we equate gifts with talents. Gifts are endowments through the Holy Ghost. Talents are something that you develop within yourself by your own proficiency and your own skill and means. There is a correlation between the two, yes, but a gift, who can develop the talent of speaking in tongues? Who can develop the talent merely through your skill to heal? Who can develop the talent to prophesy and to tell us things of 
tell us of things in the future merely by human talent. The only way you can do any of those things is if there is an infusion of power, which is life and which is revelatory, coming from up there into you, and you speak as a manifestation of it. And those are gifts. The church is a living body. Each person is designed to be alive and not to be moved around. There may be times when the Lord proves and tries your soul and gives you some instructions, and maybe a bishop does this. You say, well, my opinion of that is as good as his. But then there's the issue of obedience, and there's the issue of whether you are in tune, and the issue of how you are going to answer your conduct when you stand before the Lord and give him an account. The point of the matter is, we are dealing with a living body, with life and revelation from Christ to each person and each unit, with a living prophet and other living priesthood authorities to direct us. That's what we're talking about. Then it's in that setting that you talk about the role of the living prophet. Over here in 1 Corinthians 12, the Apostle Paul talks about the church. He says this concerning it, verses 27 to 28. God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? And the answer is no. Are all parts of your body the eye? Are all parts of your body your left hand or your right hand? No. But all of them are part of the living organism, and there's life in the living organism. There should be life in the individual. There should be life in a quorum president. And, interestingly, that life corresponds with the scope of the responsibility that's yours. If it's only individual, then it pertains to you as an individual. If you are president of an elders quorum, you have the right to the spirit of revelation so that you see and understand and perceive the needs of the members of that quorum. You may not even talk with them, and the spirit will open it to you. If you are a bishop, then you are a focal point of revelation for that board. I've served in that office, and I've served in a stake presidency, and I know what the mantle is. The mantle is an endowment, and that mantle is revelatory, and that mantle has a quality of love about it. It supersedes the love that you have within yourself, because that mantle is Christ. It's his life, it's his gifts, it's his power. We're talking about a living body, living people, and a living program. Now, within the church, there are basically two channels. Maybe this is an arbitrary way of saying it, but the purpose of, for the purpose of discussion, let me do so. There are two channels of the Spirit which open the Spirit to the individual. The first channel is the gift of the Holy Ghost, included with that the whole higher ordinances of the gospel. This gift is the most precious and important gift that a human being can have. You can learn more through the gift of the Spirit, the gift of the Holy Ghost, than you can by any academic program will ever. You can go on through and get your PhDs, and I have four college degrees. As far as the Lord is concerned, they are not worth the paper they're written on. They do open doors and give you a little status to stand on, and if you are humble, you can use them for benefit. But other than that, they are really not worth much. It takes a lot of work to get them, and you get a respect for the intellectual processes. But let me just tell you this, and bear you my testimony that the gift of the Holy Ghost is far more meaningful than the libraries of every university on earth combined. If you apply that, you can have a flow of revelation in your life that just is a new life. It's a new program. And that flow of revelation never ceases. You can have the Spirit teach you. You can have it counsel you. You can have it open things to your knowledge. It can give you warnings, etc., etc. You can have all those things, and it will lead you to the knowledge of all things. It will finally bring you up to where you can converse personally with Christ and have a knowledge of all things. That's the greatest gift you can have. Along with that are the higher gifts of the temple. When we talk about the holy endowment, you are talking about something that's endowed upon you, something that's placed upon you. The ceremony of the holy endowment is designed to give the higher revelations and endowments of the Spirit to the individual. I was released from the High Council of the Alpine Stake earlier in the year, and President banterer, who used to be a general authority and has been in this area, being president of the Jordan River Temple, which is not in our district, but nevertheless, being a member of our stake and being there a few days afterward, Helen May and I get a call wondering if we could come to the Jordan Temple and chat with the brethren. So we go over and they said, 
we are authorized to give you a call to serve as ordinance workers and officiators in the Jordan River Temple. I said, we're not even in your temple district. They never even batted an eye. We are authorized to call you. So before we had gotten out of the temple, we had been set apart and have the glorious experience of participating in that sacred program two days a week and of pondering anew from the inside, as it were, that which goes on. And when it takes 3,000 people to run the Jordan River Temple, you know that there's a lot that goes on backstage, but it's a real experience. And as, if I, as I have been administering the sacred initiatory ordinances, there's one good brother there when he administers them. He doesn't just say the words correctly. I mean, there's a spiritual power there. And I've just sat down when we've had maybe only one or two people there and had a little time and listened to him. I just said, Lord, I'm just in agony. I can say the words, but that guy has the power. You just feel the flow of the spirit. It gets you close to the temple as a source of spiritual communication and endowment. I remember when I first received my endowments. I was a young man of about 19 years old, just turned 19. I wasn't going on a mission or anything, but Dad and I decided that it might be a good idea. That was before the Idaho Falls Temple was built and we were living in the Idaho Falls area. So we went on an excursion down to the Logan Temple and there I received my endowments. I can still remember the change. It was just like putting on a warm coat on a chilly day, just a radiance of the spirit. I can still remember that and I didn't quite know what it was except I would stand and kind of blink and wonder about it. But there was an endowment that came that I could literally feel. There's that kind of thing that's open to every Latter-day Saint. If your lives are in harmony and in tune, you begin to feel it. This is a revelatory thing. The prophet Joseph in section 121 says, God shall give unto you knowledge by his spirit. Verse 26. Yea, by the unspeakable gift of the Holy Ghost that has not been revealed since the world was until now, which our forefathers have awaited with anxious expectation to be revealed in the last times, which their minds were pointed to by the angels as held in reserve for the fullness of the glory, a time to come in the which nothing shall be withheld. Whether there be one God or many gods, they shall be manifest. All thrones and dominions, principalities and powers, powers shall be revealed and set forth upon all who have endured valiantly for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also, if there be bounds set to the heavens or to the seas or to the dry land or to the moon or the sun or the stars, all the times of their revolutions, all the appointed days, months, and years, and all the days of their days, months, and years, and all their glories, laws, and set times shall be revealed in the days of the dispensation of the fullness of times. And then he says this, as well might man stretch forth his puny arm to stop the Missouri River in its decreed course, or to turn it upstream, as to hinder the Almighty from pouring down knowledge from heaven upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. Now there's one challenge, and there's one channel. But it's only one out of two. There is another channel, and of the two of them, the second is supreme. The second is supreme. That second one is the flow of the living priesthood through a prophet and through living administrators, stake presidencies, bishoprics, quorum presidencies. And of the two, as I've said, the latter is superior. If you are teaching your children, if you could just teach them two things and two things only to get these things ingrained in their lives, what would those two things be? Would they be to memorize the Beatitudes, the Ten Commandments? What would they be? Think about it. As I see it, there would be two things. Number one, Teach them how to get the Spirit of the Lord in their lives. Number two, teach them to follow the living prophet. And in priority, number two would be first. That's the priority. This gets, up, gets us to a program of ministering rather than administering. The church is not a well-oiled Gentile corporation that runs smoothly because we learn the arts of administration. That's not the goal of the church. The goal is fourth Nephi, where every man partakes of the gifts of the Spirit, and we are all free partakers of the heavenly gifts. The goal isn't merely administration. The goal is ministration. And ministration is the art of teaching divine truth and infusing the power of the Holy Spirit into the people. That's the art of ministry. It's that kind of thing that President Benson is talking about when he deals with church organization. He says, often we spend great effort in trying to increase the activity level of our stakes. We work diligently to raise the percentages of those attending sacrament meetings. We labor to get a higher percentage of our young men on missions. We strive to improve the numbers of those marrying in the temple. All of those are commendable efforts and important to the growth of the kingdom. 
But when individual members and families immerse themselves in the scriptures regularly and consistently, these other areas of activity will automatically come. Testimonies will increase. Commitment will be strengthened. Families will be fortified. Personal revolution, revelation will flow. He goes on to say, Feast upon the words of Christ. Learn the doctrine. Master the principles that are found therein. There are few other efforts that will bring greater dividends to your callings. There are few ways to gain greater inspiration as you serve. When we are talking about a living church, then we are talking about each person alive in Christ. We are talking about a flow of life and of revelation through ordained channels, centering in a living oracle, a living prophet who is alive physically, but more fully who is alive spiritually, and who is the source of the directive power for that kingdom in a revelatory way. This program is that of ministry. I have here in my Doctrine and Covenants over in section 43, and we'll get to that just a little bit later as we talk about the role of the prophet as the Lord speaks of it in that section. But let me just say at this point that I have here in the margin of this old beat-up volume, which I am going to retire one of these days and put a sign on it, Rest in Pieces. The keys of the kingdom constitute the gospel ministratively, not administratively, but ministratively. That's the source of the flow. Almond's injunction in Mosiah 18, when he organized this, the church there at the Waters of Mormon, what did he tell them? This is a vital thing. It's a vital key to how we should conduct ourselves. Verse 19 of Mosiah 18. And he commanded them that they should teach nothing, save it were the things which he had taught, and which had been spoken by the mouth of the holy prophets. Yea, even he commanded them that they should preach nothing, save it were repentance and faith on the Lord who had redeemed his people. Let me put it this way, that the living prophet sets the bounds of church doctrine, and those bounds may differ from prophet to prophet, and they may differ downwardly as well as upwardly. They may differ downwardly. In section 93, the Lord talks about the spirit of truth. The spirit of truth is this living power. Jesus is the center of it, and for this reason, Christ is called, as one of his names, the spirit of truth. That spirit flows from him to a living church, to a living people who are alive in him, alive in Christ. That spirit flows to living prophets who teach and who direct. But if there is a truth in the sense of a letter that is taught without the spirit of truth, without the living principle, then that written letter is a false doctrine, regardless of how true it may be intrinsically. For example, the principle of plural marriage has certain false doctrines associated with it for us today. That wasn't true in Brigham Young's day, but it is true of us today. There are some aspects of plural marriage today that are true. If a young man marries a wife and they marry in the temple and marry for time and eternity and they live for three or four or five years and then she dies, he is left alone and he, after a due and appropriate time, enters into another relationship and marries another young lady in the temple. He can marry her for time and eternity and she is his plural wife. That doctrine is true. But if you go out and say in section 132, the Lord reveals there the principle of plural marriage, and it's there in written letters, and you can read it and understand the rationale of the idea, and then you say, as people do today still do, therefore, let's go to and practice plural marriage. When you get to the point that you teach with the intent of admonishing obedience, you teach plural marriage with the intent of admonishing obedience, you are teaching false doctrine. You are teaching something that is not the word of God. It may be the letter, but it is not the word. The word is life. The word is spirit. The word is the living revelation of God through living prophets. And those who teach and practice plural marriage and other doctrines that have been taught in the past, regardless of their merit intrinsically, are teaching false doctrine. The living prophet is head of a living church, and that church is alive in Christ. And anything that is outside of the will of, and law of Christ through that living prophet is dead, and sometimes it's putrid and stinks. That is the basis on which the church operates. So it is not appropriate for a person to dig things up from the past and then teach them as truths if the living prophet has not sanctioned them. There is no check on how much revelation a person can receive. The Book of Mormon teaches that very dramatically. Ask yourself the question, who in the Book of Mormon taught the Nephite people? Take this thousand-year period from Lehi down to Moroni, that thousand-year period. Who taught the Nephite people the greatest and most sublime truths? Who did? The answer is not Christ in his personal ministry to him. The answer is not the prophets. What is the answer? The little children. Isn't that what's recorded? 
Why did Mormon put that in there? The Book of Mormon is a tailor-made book, and he didn't record everything that went on when Jesus visited them. But he put that one in there. Why? What does it teach us? That there is no limitation to the revelation you can get as a person, regardless of how old you are or of what sex you are. There is no limitation to the revelation that you can get. But let me tell you, there is a limitation to what you can do with it. The role of the living prophet judges that one. When we push beyond what the living prophet would say, we do wrong. The Lord has blessed me personally with a spiritual gift. It's called the gift of knowledge. It's one of the plagues of my life, has been, because as I read the scriptures at times, it just seems like the neon lamps turn on. The spirit just, boom, boom, here's what it means. And then with great joy and happiness, I go and tell someone and they say, I don't see that. And then I have the challenge at times of just keeping within the bounds. Sometimes I get a little enthusiastic and you don't know quite where the bounds are. I've learned and I'm trying. I'm still working at that. Just literally working at it as a major objective. Lord, what are the bounds as they pertain to me? And I can be sensitive enough to where the spirit can say, "Uh uh-uh, that's enough to back off. That's the kind of thing that we have to do. So Alma's injunction is very definite. The gifts of the spirit are open. And again, though priest through priesthood channels are the basis of determining how much is given. See, as Latter-day Saints, we ought to meet together instead of just telling some little emotional story that appeals to emotion, and we think we have the spirit because someone begins to feel emotional about it. There's a difference between emotion and the spirit. The spirit is emotional. It does have power in it. If you want to get the power of the spirit, you teach the scriptures. Unfold what they say. Don't just play on emotion. Unfold the scriptures, unfold the truths of eternal life, and exercise the gifts. And if we were living as we really ought to, then as we come together in a meeting, the gifts of the Spirit ought to be there, the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of revelation, the gift of tongues, the interpretation. If we don't have these, we really aren't where we should be in the gospel. That's the message of the Book of Mormon. But in the midst of all this, the Lord says in his, in this in, says this in section 46, 26, And all these gifts come from God for the benefit of the children of God, and unto the bishop of the church, and unto such as God shall appoint and ordain to watch over the church, and to be elders unto the church, are to have it given unto them to discern all those gifts, lest there shall be any among you professing, and yet not be of God. Now you may have a gift, but when it comes to expressing it among the saints, then you are subject to the living administrator in regard to what you do. And that's the basic idea. The danger is that people begin to believe that because they have the spirit of revelation, therefore it came from the Lord, and therefore what he tells me I can do. Sometimes the Lord doesn't have too many inhibitions in what he tells you. He can reveal truths that go beyond what the prophet teaches. I'll give you an illustration from church history. Lorenzo Snow was a young man. Before he was ever a member of the church, he went to Kirtland. He sat in on what they then called a blessing meeting. A blessing meeting was conducted by Patriarch Joseph Smith Sr., the prophet's father. He said, we're going to have a blessing meeting tonight. He had a recorder there, and anyone who comes and wanted to get a patriarchal blessing, he could come. He would talk to them for a while and then say, okay, who wants to have a patriarchal blessing? Lorenzo Snow was at one of those meetings, and he was impressed very much so. He wasn't a member yet, and he walked to Joseph Smith Sr. and began talking with him. Joseph Smith Sr. had the spirit of revelation and said, Brother Snow, the day will come when you will be a member of the church, and you will become as big as you want to be, even as big as God is. Now that's a powerful one to lay on an investigator. He pondered that and pondered that on through the Kirtland period where he joined the church, clear on through the Nauvoo period. And as he was finally pondering it, The whole flood of revelation opened up to him, and he formed that popular couplet, As man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. The footnote to that is this. While he he got that revelation, he didn't teach it. He said, I kept it to myself until I heard Joseph Smith the prophet talk on the doctrine, and then I felt free to express it to others. That's the key, and that's the check. So there are two channels, and don't get caught up because you think it's true, and it is true, and then become your own revelator. Then you become your own prophet, and then you cut yourself off from the living body. And your quest for truth is the very thing that cuts you off, because the element of pride comes in there. You know what President Benson has said about that one. 
the element of pride comes in. It's just this simple. We can't be saved, for example, without our dead. We all know that. Salvation is a family matter. Neither can we be saved without prophets, apostles, stake presidencies, and bishops, because they constitute the channels through which the spirit of life and revelation and wisdom and guidance and even discipline flow. I've been involved in that disciplinary action and feature of things. We held a high council court one time. It started at 7 in the morning, and it went clear through the day and on into the evening. I got home at 1 in the morning after. We had two 10-minute breaks, but the spirit of revelation was there, and when that decision came down, there wasn't an issue in regard to it. The spirit of revelation flowed. So that's the beautiful thing about it. I've been close enough administratively on some levels to know that it is an actuality. Now, the idea of spiritual development is that faith is not mere belief, but the capacity to acquire the spirit of the Lord and the gifts of the spirit. The prophet Joseph Smith put it this way as he spoke of the gifts here in the teachings, page 270 to 271. Because faith is wanting, the fruits there, because faith is wanting, the fruits are. No man since the world ha was had faith without having something along with it. The ancients quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Women received their dead. By faith the worlds were made. A man who has none of the gifts has no faith, and he deceives himself if he supposes he has. Faith has been wanting, not only among the heathen, but in professed Christendom also, so that tongues, healings, prophecy, and prophets and apostles, and all the gifts and blessings have been wanting. If we have faith, you'll have the gifts of the Spirit. You'll have the Spirit of Revelation. If we don't have the Spirit of Revelation and we don't have the gifts of the Spirit, then we don't have faith. And we need to heed the prophet and awake because we are a church under condemnation, not only for that reason, but for higher reasons that people who understand the Book of Mormon understand. Secondly, then, we must acquire and internalize the spiritual power and its gifts. As the prophet put it, it's not enough merely to enjoy reading the revelations of God to other people. Reading the experiences of others, the revelations of them, can never give us a comprehensive view of our current condition and true relation to God. Knowledge of these things can only be attained by experience to the ordinances of God, and those ordinances are the gifts, gift of the Holy Ghost, the temple, and through priesthood leaders, priesthood channels. These can only be obtained by experience to the ordinances of God set forth, set for that purpose. He goes on and says, I assure the saints that the truth in reference to these matters can and may be known through the revelations of God in a way of his in the way of his ordinances. That isn't revelation like you're out in a camp meeting and you feel like you've had some inspiration. Revelation in the way of his ordinances through the gift of the Holy Ghost, through the living oracles, through those who are appointed appropriately to teach and to direct. The Hebrew church came unto the spirits of men just the Hebrew church came unto the spirits of just men made perfect. They got clear up there into the realm of the second comfort or blessings, unto an innumerable company of angels, unto God the Father of all, and to Jesus Christ the mediator of the new covenant. What did they learn by coming to the spirits of just men made perfect? Is it written? No. What they learned has not been and could not have been written. What object was gained by this communication with the spirits of the just? Then he answers very significantly. It was the established order of the kingdom. What's the order? It's to exercise faith, to begin to get the spirit, to finally come like the brother of Jared back into God's presence. And it's a personal individual thing. Section 76 talks about those who get to the celestial kingdom and it indicates they are they who have paid this kind of price. Note how the wording is expressed. It says here, verse 67, these are they who have come and the wording is past tense. These are they who have come. They've been there. They, by their experience, have arrived up there. These are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly of the church of Enoch and of the firstborn. This can be rather easy to determine who makes it to the celestial kingdom. The Lord just looks around and says, who has their heads above the veil? Okay, come on, you're in the celestial kingdom. And who doesn't have their heads above the veil? Well, then you are something less than celestial. See, we have the idea that our life is like being placed on a balance scale and the Lord is going to take all these things that are evil and wrong and put them on one end and all the good deeds on the other and he's going to balance them off. And we just hope the good outbalances the evil. Well, that whole line of thinking is idiotic. First of all, you come unto Christ. He 
just pays the debt of that, and that's all forgotten about, isn't it? And then secondly, the issue is that there's something in addition in the gospel plan, the preparatory gospel. The preparatory gospel is faith, repentance, and baptism by which you get the barrier cleared away and all the crud taken off the balance scales. That's the preparatory gospel. But in addition to that, there is an everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel is the plan of life that leads to eternal life. It's like living water springing up unto everlasting life. It's the thing Jesus was talking about when he said, I am the bread of life. It's something that nourishes, that feeds. And then the issue is, have you grown in that to where you finally come up? Thank goodness we get through into the spirit world and into the resurrection to make that determination rather than having to do it all here. The point is, when you get to the day of judgment, the question will be, how many of those who have come, how many are there who have come up to celestial presence and they are celestial? It's just that simple and that easy. Then there may be judgments above that in regard to where you fit in the celestial kingdom. The Doctrine and Covenants is a revelation that gives us important keys of insight into this, and there are three revelations primarily that are important on this subject. One is section 21, which was given the church the day the church was organized. The second one is section 28, which was given later that fall. And then section 43, which comes a little after that one. When the church was organized, there were two priesthood leaders in the church. There were Joseph and Oliver. You had a first and a second elder relationship in regard to priesthood functions. They were apostles, both of them. They were prophets. They received the holy apostleship. But as the Lord instructed them on that day, he says this, verse 4, Wherefore, meaning the church, thou shalt give heed unto all his words and commandments, which he shall give unto you as he receiveth them, walking in all holiness before me. For this, for his word ye shall receive, as if from mine own mouth, in all patience and faith. Now that's a powerful statement. That has tremendous significance. What the Lord is here saying is that when you listen to the living prophet, that what he says is just as though Christ had said it himself, and your responsibility to heed it and to obey and to internalize and apply it is just as great as though Jesus himself had said it. That's what he's saying. That is the stature of the living prophet. That is the stature. And our responsibility is to accept that on, the, on that premise, on that basis. Then note what he says about the benefits that follow. As we read this, go back and pick up this idea that we are a living body and that there are channels. There's the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's the temple ordinances as channels of power. But there are also channels of priesthood power. And if we put all those into operation, what then is the benefit spiritually. Note what he says. For by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Yea, the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before you and cause the heavens to shake for your good and his name's glory. In other words, there will be power infused into this body that we call the church. And even so much that the elements themselves will be subject to that power. That's what the Lord is saying. If we are in full harmony with the living prophet. Having said that, some of the saints didn't really pick up on it very fast. One of these was Oliver Cowdery, who was the second elder in the church. Oliver had a brother-in-law by the name of Hiram Page. Both Oliver and Hiram Page had married Whitmer daughters, sisters to John and Peter Whitmer. So they are kind of tied in family-wise. Hiram Page, while knocking around out in the woods one day, found a stone. It's just about that round and that shape, if I can put it that way, and about that thick. There were two holes drilled through it, about that far apart. That stone is still in existence. The reorganized church has it. I was visiting their headquarters there some years ago, and I asked if I could see it. They were kind enough to let me look at it. I drew on a piece of paper the outline of the stone. Someone has treated it rather badly because it had been, has been broken right down the middle. And when I saw it, they had a piece of electrical, this black electrical tape, tape <clears throat> that they had wrapped around to hold the two ends together. Hiram Page found this stone, I guess because it had holes that are rather narrow for your eyes to get in. You kind of had to look squinty-eyed or cross-eyed to get into it, but he was looking through that stone and claimed to receive revelation. He was running them off by the batch. There was quite a lot of interest on certain topics of the, of the time, and he was running revelations off. Even Oliver, his brother-in-law, said, hey, we have another prophet in the church. He kind of began supporting him. 
<clears throat> when it came to the second general conference of the church, the conference in the fall of 1831, the thing was on the agenda. We have another prophet in the church, and how are we going to work this out so that Joseph Smith can move over a little bit? Well, Newell Knight, who was a priesthood leader in the church at Colesville, down in the southern part of the state of New York, came up to that conference as a representative of the branch that he was living in. He stayed with the prophet Joseph Smith that night before the conference. He says that the prophet never slept that night. He said he spent the whole night in prayer and meditation about this problem. There's a real example of the concern and interest of the prophet Joseph. <clears throat> He says, when the conference began the next day, the prophet had such an endowment of power, the earth just literally shook as he walked with the endowment of power that he had, that there was no question as to who the prophet and who, who was the prophet and who had the keys. In the course of that conference, the prophet was given section 28. It is directed initially towards Oliver Cowdery because Oliver is the second elder of the church and Oliver ought to have some relationship with Joseph. So, the Lord approaches Oliver first and then tells him to go to get Hiram Page corrected. But note what he says, verse 2. Behold, verily, verily, I say unto thee, no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church, excepting my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., for he receiveth them even as Moses. And thou shalt be obedient unto the things which I shall give unto him, even as Aaron, to declare faithfully the commandments and the revelations, with power and authority unto the church. He is speaking to Oliver. And if thou art led at any time by the comforter to speak or teach, or at all times by the way of commandment unto the church, thou mayest do it. But thou shalt not write by way of commandment, but by wisdom. A visiting brother comes, for example, to the snowflake stake. He gives you direction. This is the word and the will of the Lord to you. But does that person have the right to make that commandment to the whole church? The answer is no. It's the flow of the Spirit and the living revelation to you. When it comes to writing... Then you can write by commandment, and you can write by wisdom, and there's only one man in the church who can write by commandment. And who is that? That's the living prophet, and all other people in the church write by way of wisdom. We have church literature written by men who are not and have not been the prophet. That which they write should be accepted how? As wisdom. Not as the law of the church, but as wisdom. The living prophet only writes by way of commandment. However eloquently a person may write, and James E. Talmadge could write eloquently. I envy the ability they have to put words into sentences, but James E. Talmadge did not write by way of commandment. I like the way President J. Reuben Clark used to handle it in his books. He made it clear that what he was putting out there in written form was not the official commandment of the Lord, even though he was a member of the First Presidency. But he put it out as his wisdom and his counsel, and on that basis, then, we should keep things properly separated. In section 43, though, we come back to this and have one of the choicest statements in the church on the role of the living prophet. Here the Lord, beginning with verse set 4, says, Verily I say unto you that none else shall be appointed unto this gift, that is, the gift of revelation and, of, and giving commandments and official direction. None else shall be appointed unto this gift except it be through him, through Joseph. For if it be taken from him, he shall not have power except to appoint another in his stead. And this shall be a law unto you that you receive not the teachings of any that shall come before you as revelations or commandments. And this I give unto you, that you may not be deceived, that you may know they are not of me. For verily I say unto you, that he that is ordained of me shall come in at the gate and be ordained, as I have told you before, to teach those revelations which you have received and shall receive through him whom I have appointed. And now behold, I give unto you a commandment, that when you are assembled together, you shall instruct and edify each other, that ye may know how to act and direct my church, how to act upon the points of my law and commandments which I have given. In other words, learn the spirit of revelation and how it operates, and make that the subject of your discussion. Then know what he says as a result of this. And thus ye shall become instructed in the law of my church, and be sanctified by that which ye have received. Now, I said there are two channels of power. One is that which is given to me personally to see in the ordinances of the gospel. The other is that channel that is given to me through the living prophet and living priesthood leaders. And if I heed that, then there is much power by which I can be sanctified, by which I can gain the mastery of my mortal weaknesses. And be sanctified by that which ye have received, and ye shall bind yourselves to act in all holiness before me, that inasmuch as ye do this, glory shall be added to the kingdom, spiritual power, life, vitality, dynamics. This will be added to the kingdom. And inasmuch as ye do it not, it shall be taken, even that which ye have received. This is what we call priesthood ministration. And it's at this point 
that I put that little statement, the keys of the kingdom constitute the gospel administratively. There is no salvation as an individual, either without your family, without being sealed to your progenitors and your posterity. Neither is there salvation except through the flow of the Spirit through living oracles. You have several statements of this kind made by the brethren. Let me just run through one or two of them. Here's one by Elder James E. Faust. I do not believe that members of the church can be in full harmony with the Savior without sustaining his living prophet on the earth, the president of the church. If we do not stain, sustain the living prophet, whoever we may be, we die spiritually. See, it's an issue of life. We die spiritually. Ironically, some of us, some have died spiritually by exclusively following prophets who have been long dead. See, there's that dead letter, and there's a living letter. He says, Others equivocate in their support of living prophets, trying to lift themselves up and putting down the living prophets, however subtlety they may act. Here's another thing. We have just heard the prophet of God. Again from Elder Faust. He is a watchman on the tower. He has raised a warning voice. I would urge all to listen and follow his counsel. It is tremendously important always to be in harmony with those who, according to Paul, have watched for our souls, as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Isaiah spoke of a people who did not care to listen to their prophets and seers, who were urged to say to the seers, Seek not to the prophets, prophesy not, write things unto us, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Nephi explained, The guilty taketh the truth to be hard, for it cutteth them to the very center. And then from President Kimball, To be a prophet of the Lord, one does not need to be everything to all men. He does not need to be a youthful, athletic, an industrialist, a financier, an agriculturist. He does not need to be a music musician, a poet, an entertainer, nor a banker, a physician, nor a college president, a military general, or a scientist. He does not need to be a linguist to speak French and Japanese and German and Spanish, but he must understand the divine language and be able to receive messages from heaven. He need not be an orator, for God can make his own. The Lord can present his divine message to weak men made strong. He substituted a strong voice for the quiet, timid voice of Moses and gave the young man Enoch power that made men tremble in his presence. For Enoch walked with God as Moses walked with God. The Lord said, whether by my own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. What the world needs is a prophet leader who gives example of example clean, full of faith, godlike in his attributes, with an untarnished name, a beloved husband, a true father. A prophet needs to be more than a priest or a minister or an elder. His voice becomes the voice of God to reveal new programs, new truths, new solutions. I make no cl claim to infallibility for him. But he does need to be recognized of God and an authoritative person. He is no pretender as numerous are who presumptuously presume positions without appointment and authority that is not given. He must speak like his Lord as one having authority and not as the scribes. President Benson gives us an example of Brigham Young. If I were to characterize Brigham Young, I would call him Joseph Smith's most attentive disciple. Men like Orson Pratt had tremendous minds. Orson Pratt's learning was recognized by the Royal Society of London, but Brigham Young had this quality of character that he believed, and he just simply accepted everything that Joseph Smith said. But there was one time, apparently, when he had a 15-second relapse, and he talks about that. This is President Benson quoting him. President Brigham Young revealed that on one occasion he was tempted to be cynical, critical of the Prophet Joseph Smith regarding a certain financial matter. Keep in mind that Brigham had some real gifts in this area. He said that the feeling did not last more than perhaps 30 seconds. That feeling, he said, caused him great sorrow in his heart. The lesson he gave to members of the church in his day may well be increased in significance today because the devil continues more active. I clearly saw and understood, said Brigham Young, by the spirit of revelation manifested to me that if I were to harbor a thought in my heart that Joseph could be wrong in anything, I would begin to lose confidence in him. And that feeling would grow from step to step and from one degree to another until at last I would have the same lack of confidence in his being the mouthpiece of the Almighty. I repented of my unbelief, and that too very suddenly. I repented about as quick as I committed the error. I was not. It was not for me to question whether Joseph was dictated by the Lord at all times and under all circumstances. It was not my prerogative to call him into question at any time with regard to any act of his life. He was God's servant and not mine. 
He did not belong to the people, but to the Lord and was doing the work of the Lord. Now that's the attitude. And that's the thing I believe that made Brigham Young the man that he finally became. President Benson following in that tradition gives us this counsel. To the Latter-day Saints, the world over, we say, let not your hearts be troubled. Keep the commandments of God. Follow the counsel of his living prophet. Take care not to exceed the counsel with your own private views. I've had some interesting experiences, if I can just take a minute before we conclude and just recount a few of them. It reminds me a little of my great granddad. He was at Kirtland when the spiritual endowment was poured out there at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. He was a member of the first Quorum of Seventy at that time. I don't know. He might have taken it a little bit casually because after that dedicatory meeting, he said, I saw everyone else speaking in tongues and prophesying and having a good time. But personally, Joseph, I didn't get much myself. What do you think about me? Joseph Seth said, well, have you really seriously fasted and prayed about it? He said, well, I just came to meeting. Joseph said, if you want the spirit of revelation, you've got to seek for it. Well, he was mature enough at that point that he laid siege on that thing. Three days after the dedicatory service, they held the first solemn assembly in the Kirtland Temple. At that time, they had another endowment, and my great-grandfather writes in his journal, I saw fire descend from heaven, and it rested upon us, and we spoke with tongues and prophesied. Later in my mission, after I got, cow- called, after I got out of the North Carolina West District, they put me over into Kentucky and made me a supervising elder of the eastern half of the District of Kentucky. Eastern half of the state. state. I needed a car. I had a good brother with me who had a car, and I made him my companion so I'd have some wheels. Then he was released to go home, and I needed a pair of wheels. I got into Lexington, and when I arrived there was a good brother who had just bought a used Pontiac in good shape. He said, I'll give you a couple hundred dollars off of this if you want to buy it. He looked like a tremendous buy. It looked like a tremendous buy. It was a clean outfit and all of that. I was just about ready to say yes and thought maybe I'd better counsel with the mission president. I went to the phone and called him and said, President Richards, I need a car, as you know, and I'm here at Lexington and this brother has a car and he's willing to knock off a couple hundred dollars. He just got it the other day and he wants to sell it to me. What do you think about that? He pondered for a minute and said, Elder, don't buy it. It's just about knocked me off the phone. I had everything going and just needed consent to go buy it. I said, President, you know I need a car. He said, yes, but don't buy it. I said, is there any reason I shouldn't? He said, well, you need one, but the Spirit says don't buy it. I had enough audacity to say, President, you really feel the Spirit says that? Yes. He bore his testimony through the phone. So I hung up and I went to the good brother and I told him, well, I can't buy it. He let me take it to drive over to Winchester and back. When I got back the next day, I found it had a broken engine block. It would have cost me the job of putting it putting in a whole new engine on the thing. Beside that, it was wintertime and a tremendous snowstorm came to Lexington. It piled snow up at least two feet high and the whole city was just bogged down. Just before the snowstorm, and this was right after World War II, when they started building those old Kaisers. Do you remember the Kaiser car? There was a Kaiser agency there in Lexington and the third, and the thing had caught fire. A lot of the cars had been damaged with just the ceiling burning and the little drops of stuff on the paint and that kind of thing. They were selling them out. I got down there, but they said they had them all sold. But there were two of them that hadn't been delivered. So the only thing I could say was, well, if they don't come pick these up, can I get a chance at them? They were selling them for about half price, a new car at half price. That night, this two-foot snowstorm hit and it just piled snow up and everything came to a stop. What they told me was that if the fellow didn't get there by the next Monday morning, then I could have it. Well, things were all balled up during the weekend. Monday morning, I got on my boots and trod down there and said, how about those two cars? They said, well, no one has come to get one. I said, fine, I'll take one. So I bought a new car for $1,200. Follow this counsel of the spirit. Let me give you another one. I was serving as a bishop. Well, actually, I served as a bishop in three stakes without being released, all of them on BYU campus. That's when they were really building stakes all over the place. I had a stake president by the name of Sidaway. I had served for that year, and one of my counselors had moved away. I needed another counselor. I had at that time a young man working for me who was just a tremendous person. He went through the BYU testing program of the National Academics Test and ranked right up there within 1% or 2% of the whole nation. I mean, he was a real solid, dynamic, and powerful young man. He was working for me as a research assistant. 
He was in our stake. The policy of the stake was that he doesn't have to be in your ward. He just has to be in your stake. So I never really thought about who I ought to have as a replacement. I just thought, hey, I'm going to have him. So I turned his name into the stake presidency without really going to the Lord and asking, should I do that? I just turned his name in. Then stake meeting came along and the stake high council was meeting. And there in the same building in the night building on campus, my other counselor and I, and this was late toward the summer, and we were preparing for the new summer session as the students came in in the fall. And we were going through the list of people that we had to study out and think about who I might call as a new counselor. We were going down the list one after another. I was thinking about who I was going to call to fill church offices, who I wanted for a new Sunday school superintendent, who I wanted for that. I came down that list and came to the name of a young married man by the name of Ken Higby, who is now a member of the faculty of BYU. When I got to that name, he had been teaching a Sunday school class and I hadn't really known him too well. He had just come in when I got to that name. The spirit in an audible voice said, that's the man for your counselor. And that was a tremendously thrilling thing, the power of light and witness and confirmation. And I wasn't even, and yet it was the most sickening thing I could feel. The whole thing came to my mind. Then have I counseled with the Lord? The answer was no. I hadn't counseled with the Lord. Had I prayed about it? The answer was no, not really. I turned that name in and the high council was meeting next door to clear my name for a counselor, the name I had proposed. And there the spirit of revelation told me that that, that the guy I ought to have as a counselor was Ken Higby. I just sat back in the midst of the beauty of the revelation and the agony of my soul. The compound of the two just churned within me, literally churned within me. Then I said, then I just said, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. And then being a radical oddball, a radical oddball that I am, I got to thinking, I wonder what the stake presidency is going to do about that name I turned in. I wonder if they are going to just stamp it automatically like I did. I wonder what's going to happen there. And instead of rushing down there and saying, hey, fellas, I made a mistake, I just decided to ride the thing through and see what happened. So after the meeting was over, I went in. The stake president was talking with some of the brethren there, and I kind of stood and waited my turn. When I walked up to him finally, how are you, president? And we shook hands. I told him I had been in a meeting next door discussing things with my other counselor about who we ought to have as ward members. Then I was just about ready to get around to it and said, President, did you consider the name that I submitted? He said, yes, we considered it. At that point, someone else came up and he just willingly left me off and went to talk to this other guy. He kind of left me standing there. So I went through the process of listening and waiting again. And when he got through, I sidled up to him again. After a few more comments of introduction, I slid into the theme again. President, I turned this name in. Did you consider it? Yes, we considered that. Did you discuss it? Yes, we discussed it. And again, no response. Finally, he walked out of the door, so I walked after him. I followed him clear into, out into the parking lot. Finally, when he got to the car and got his hand on the door, and then, then I finally faced up to the issue. I said, President, I submitted a name. He can tell you, can you tell me what your feeling is on that? He finally, hesitantly, screwed up his courage and turned around and looked at me square in the eye and said, Bishop, we felt that maybe you ought to give some reconsideration to that call. Then I told him the story, and we had a beautiful experience together. Now that's the spirit of revelation. A person who isn't in tune with that and who isn't living in tune with that can't be exalted. He may grow theologically, but he cannot grow in that substance, line upon line, precept upon precept, that finally internalizes not just the theology, but the processes of the kingdom of God in his life. You can't do that unless your focus is on the loving prophet. That's my testimony. That that's what we're dealing with. First of all, we're dealing with a living church with living channels. I bear you my testimony that we have a prophet of God and he is a living prophet. In our stake, we've compiled a list of his teachings, inspired messages from all of his teachings. And these messages have done more for our stake than any one thing that we've done for a long while. Because when people really study what President Benson said, they find the spirit of revelation there. They begin to apply it, and it changes their lives. Now, may the Lord bless you, my brothers and sisters. If there are any questions, maybe we can just conclude, and we can deal with them afterward. Questions and answers. Question. They can't make it out. Answer. The Church of Jesus Christ is that church into which we enter by baptism and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, and the basic medium of ministry to us as individuals spiritually is the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
The church of the firstborn is that inner church into which we enter by making our calling and election sure and are sealed unto eternal life. People who enter the church of the firstborn do so through the sealing powers of the holy priesthood. The spiritual blessings that are available to them are those that pertain to the second covenant, the opening of the veil, being taught by the spirits of just men made perfect, angels, the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, Christ, and even the Father can minister to you. So one is the outer church, which is a contingent of nature, which is of a contingent nature. The other is the inner church of those who are sealed. Question. Could you expand on learning by the Spirit by our educational processes today? For example, certain subjects like algebra and science? Let me suggest, if you want to learn by the Spirit, really thoroughly master Alma 32 and 33. Not just the one chapter, but also Alma 33. Planting the seed and making the experiment. Faith is a capacity to probe into the realm of the Spirit and to open the revelatory power of the Spirit into your life. And you have to do it line upon line and precept upon precept. It comes through prayer, through study, through obedience, through commitment, and then through reaching and having your focus in the right direction. Question. Does speaking in tongues and fire from heaven as your great-great-grandfather experienced ever happen nowadays? Answer. Well, there are occasions. I was talking to a good brother in the Jordan Temple. He used to be president of a stake in Berlin after World War II, when President Benson was then European president of the church. President Benson couldn't talk German, and this brother couldn't talk English. President Benson called this good brother, and this good brother suggested that maybe they ought to get an elder who could translate for them with them on the phone. President Benson said, no, don't worry about that. And they talked for 20 minutes and understood each other perfectly, except when they started talking about personal things. When they talked about official things, they could understand. When they talked about personal things, neither one could understand the other. This good brother told me that story himself. I've been trying to let him, trying to get him to write it up. Question. If the church is a living body and we are truly infused with this life, then are we part of the body of Christ? Answer. The answer is yes. In the sense that we are partakers or co-heirs of his glory, that's true. That's how you become co-heirs with Christ. You come into that program and partake of that life. Question. Then does it also follow that if we are cut off from the body, we have done it by rebellion? Are we therefore no longer partakers of the glory because we have rejected it? Answer. The answer is yes. It's part of a living system. It's like cutting off your home from the telephone wire or from the electrical line outside. The fridge doesn't work any longer. You are cut off. Question. <clears throat> you spoke of no resurrection after those resurrected at this time of the Savior's resurrection. Do we understand then that the prophet Joseph was not yet resurrected? Answer. I don't know, and you can quote me. My understanding of that, though, is that there will be those who are resurrected prior to the coming of Christ to the Mount of Olives. I believe personally, as a matter of personal belief, that Joseph Smith will be one of those. Thanks a lot.